When he made the last entry in the diary, the diary. he didn't know how horribly he would die. The hospitals has concluded that the unburied dead are coming back to life, seeking human victims. I'm Frederick Lawrence, and I've rented a house on Haunted Hill tonight so that my wife can give a party. Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome back to Attack of the 70 Foot Podcast. I am your host, Calvin Modier McCarthy, and uh, with me I have my co host, Chris Jaiwardna, getting closer with the name. That and, was perfect. Uh, that, that was, was perfect. perfect. Awesome. And uh, yeah, it's it's just the two of us today. We're missing our third. We we could not get someone to come back on the show. So Yeah. It well it, it in all in all fairness, I mean, we're you know, it's it's horror, you know, it may just be uh, the body will turn up somewhere. <laughs> right. Um unfortunately, uh, we are missing uh Michael Gibson, who was on our last episode, he's working on a project currently, and then uh, Zach Carter, who works for Severin, who would have been perfect for this podcast, is also busy uh, with a deadline for, uh, I'm assuming, some other uh, Blu-rays that are coming out somewhere down the line, so... Yeah, we're going to have to get like the uh, the early scoop from him one of these days. We're going to have to actually get him to do that for us. So, I, so you're, you're, you're saying that I should make sure to invest in a little bit of ether, some good rope, and a sturdy chair? Yes, exactly. Exactly. We'll just force it out of him somehow, one way or another. Now he's a nice guy. He'd probably do it if we just asked. Yeah, um, no, he's a total sweetheart. Speaking of Severin Films, they have uh, three new releases coming out. Uh, Massacre in Dinosaur Valley, which is really good cannibal film. Have you Have you seen that one? I don't. So my dad blind bought it at Everyday Music years ago, had even forgotten that it was there. But I keep running into it on my DVD shelf because he just tossed it in, in the collection there in my bedroom. And uh, so we haven't watched it yet. But I saw that after that trailer, I'm like, oh, yes, I need this mm-hmm. in my life. And uh, I, I'm assuming you have the Blue Underground DVD release. Um, you know, well, I... go ahead and keep going through the news. I'm going to actually go check. <laughs> I'll be yeah. right back. Um, and then, uh, Primitives, which I've actually never seen. That's another, uh, cannibal film, um, that I am looking forward to getting a copy of. And, uh, of course, Cruel Jaws is finally getting its first ever official American release, uh, also known as Jaws 5, Cruel Jaws, which is a movie that we're going to be talking about today. So once again... It's sad that we do not have Zach Carter on this podcast because he would be able to give us uh, maybe some some extra information that some of us uh, don't have and probably won't have until we actually get the release of this Blu-ray. So once again, sad news there that Zach Carter is not going to be on the show. Yeah. What did you find out, Chris? Um, Shriek Show, of all things. Oh, Okay. Yeah, huh. I wonder. I wonder how that transfer is. So, so you haven't watched it yet? No. It's good. It's good. The only thing is, there's no dinosaurs in it. Oh man, I was yeah. hoping for. Is, is, is there at least like lizards, like alligators or something? Uh, not that I can remember. It's like di- It's like uh, like an archaeological gold mine. There's like dinosaur bones. It's like this uh, camp okay. tribe lives in dinosaur valley but there are no dinosaurs in it yeah it was it was a letdown the first time i saw it isn't it, stacy keach isn't in that is he uh s- mentions michael sopkin okay Sopku. i yeah, think stacy Sopku and yeah no sign of stacy keach there no 
Yeah, Stacy Keach, I think, is in. It must be like um, Slave of the Cannibal God or whatever that one is. I'm pretty uh, sure it's Slave of. The, I think, yeah, is yeah. Yeah. Let me. Let, I, I'm going to do. I'm going to do the uh, check. But yeah, keep going, sir. Yeah, um, but that's about it for Severin. Um, I do like their bundles. I've never actually done one of their big bundles that like come with different things. Um, it's like 122 bucks. If uh, if everyone wasn't so paranoid about uh, work and and what COVID's gonna do, I would probably buy this just to get the little the little shark toy, <laughs> little water. Oh gun. my god, the water gun! Yeah, especially because I want to fill that with like you know, uh, uh, kind of like fake blood in there, you know? Right. Yeah, but um, unfortunately, and it's got the the toilet seat decal too. It's got that all that a, fun that's stuff. So good. Yeah, that's yeah. so good. But I don't know. I don't know if I feel comfortable parting with 122 bucks right now. Oh, dude, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I've. Uh, she already knows, but I'm getting my girlfriend a uh, a custom little doll, and uh, yeah, that's. It's one of those. It's like cool. Like, I mean, the good news is I'm set for you know the the holiday gift, but it's also like, it's like, oh wow, that was uh, that was a bit of money. And yeah, yeah. and speaking of. Ex- Expensive. Speaking of expensive sets, um, this is a bit of a segue into other news and other Blu-ray releases. So I just came across the news of the Hammer Films Ultimate Collection that has been announced for November seventeenth, twenty twenty. You can pre-order it now. It is a hundred bucks for oh. twenty films. Oh shit! See, that is perfect, except for it comes out in November and not October, which is my Hammer month. October right. is always actually it's funny I was going to mention this about news as well if anyone has listened to our Halloween podcast I mentioned that um, every October I go through a uh, hammer movie binge most specifically the uh, Frankenstein films and I get mm. a bunch of Frankenberry and Frankenberry is at the stores right now I actually just had a bowl of Frankenberry before starting this podcast so I'm already getting nice. ready for it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I love how like because uh, I'm more more on Twitter these days at Chris Jabberwock and <laughs> everybody on Twitter is basically all right. September 1st, 60 days of Halloween. Let's go. Yep, exactly. It's like you just you segue right out of summer right into uh, uh, into Halloween. Um, unfortunately, this year is an election year, so there's a little bit of uh, focus on that. So it'll be tougher right. You know, every four years, it's like a little, little bit tough to like tune the rest of the world out during September and concentrate on Halloween. But uh, I'm still committed to doing it. Certainly. Um, and actually, speaking of the Frankenstein films, uh, in this Blu-ray set is the Revenge of Frankenstein, 1958, is in this uh, this new oh, set. Oh, nice. Is that the only Frankenstein film that they're putting out? In this in, coll- in, in, in this box, yes, but it's a wide selection. So here, the rest of the titles include, uh, and many of these actually, my my dad's actually already gotten through Indicator, uh, the Two Face of Doctor Jekyll, the Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, these are the Damned, the Old Dark House, the Gorgon, the Snorkel, Maniac, Die Die My Darling, Scream of Fear, Stop Me Before I Kill, Never Take Candy from a Stranger, Cash on Demand, The Stranglers of Bombay, The Terror of the Tongs, The Pirates of Blood River, The Devil Ship Pirates. The Camp on Blood Island, Yesterday's Enemy, and The Creatures the World Forgot. Oh, see, I already have, like, all of those. And a lot yeah. of them on, on Blu-ray, which is, uh, because I think it's um, uh, it's one of the smaller companies that uh, releases that, uh, like Echo Bridge or something like that. They release their own uh, Blu-ray sets uh, of, of some of those. Never Take Candy from a Stranger is actually a really good one. Um, it's like actually horrifying obviously because it's like about pedophilia mm, uh, i i definitely recommend that film though it's done really really well and, it, and for being such like an old film i think it's early 60s late 50s if i'm not mistaken uh, 1960 yep right on the yeah. mark um and it's like black and white and it's so old and i remember when i got it and i was like all right i'm I'm just gonna watch this you know just go into it blind and i thought oh you know this will be kind of interesting to see them kind of dance around that subject because it's the 60s i don't imagine a lot of people were really talking about this as a 
real problem, even in the UK. But no, man, it's it's a pretty pretty unflinching little movie. It it kind of blew me away that people don't really reference that film very much. No, Gee, no pun intended. Yeah. I was <laughs> no. about to say it's like you know maybe maybe you have a you have a new topic coming up there. Yeah. Then. Yeah, it's 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 sort of an uncomfortable one though. It's not yeah. really like a fun movie. But now we're getting yeah, it's out a, of that tangent. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, similarly, I mean, what I'm hoping is at some point, uh, I totally forgot. Shout has a Blu-ray of it out, but the the one that comes to mind when thinking of just more disturbing, creepier Hammer films to me was uh, Demons of the Mind. Always kind of creeped me out a little yeah. more. Yeah, because that. There was this weird. I love this powerlessness of those characters that they can't stop this curse that's that's uh, making them, you know, enact a incestuous act. Yeah, yeah. Hammer had the ability to actually do some creepy things, um, and it's funny that I, I. I mean, I guess they were just you know much more commercially uh, uh, popular. But that they lean so much, so heavily into like the revival of the Universal monsters, when they would mm-hmm. make movies that were like, you know, pretty good, pretty pretty scary. There's another one called Paranoiac that's a really really good one. I, I hear really good things. Yeah, you're you're the third person to tell me I need to see that. Oh, so. Paranoiac, yeah, it's a, it's a really good one. But it's funny from Shout Factory. I I just recently bought. Um, the Blu-ray of uh, the Mummy Shroud. Um, I really like the the Hammer Mummy movies. They always kind of got overlooked for me for some reason. I didn't really like them when I was like in my teens. And just revisiting them, I really, I'm, I'm really starting to um, really like them. Um, Curse of the Mummy's Tomb is actually my favorite. Oddly enough, that's a fun one. Yeah, I've I've seen that. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Other news. Go for it. So, uh, so the uh, the next thing is that Scream Factory, as of today, uh, or the last the couple of days, uh, they have now detailed their Friday the Thirteenth collection. This is quite possibly, for me at least, the most comprehensive box set for Friday the Thirteenth that I've personally have seen. Mm-hmm. Uh, this includes every film, including let's see. It includes the remake, Freddy vs. Jason, Jason 10, and the uncut Jason Goes to Hell. Um, so it's that's pretty comprehensive. It's they've uh, you can go check out the new uh, the new details. They have a bunch of 4K scans from the original camera negatives for a bunch of these new transfers. Uh, they have even like restored the mono track to the original Friday the Thirteenth. Uh, they have they have uncut versions of a ton of them. They even have and we, you know Calvin and I had just spotted this through our our colleagues on Facebook talking about it that. Uh, the at long last the slash scenes the uncut gore shots from Friday the 13th part 2 have been uncovered it looks like it's going to be off of a kind of a high quality VHS tube but mm-hmm. uh, but that being said we get to finally see it i mean i i were there even photographs of some of these shots at this point you know i don't i don't know that i research i, I don't know that i looked into it that heavily um i i like the friday the 13th films i don't love them i i mm-hmm. watch them for fun um but you know that wouldn't have been something that i i would have really researched i i did know that it was pretty uh watered down the yeah. second movie uh yeah. but yeah i know there are a couple others too right because i think part seven also uh, uh, you can watch like a look yeah um because the it's funny uh because i think that paramount uh, a few years ago, maybe two years ago, released a um, a Blu-ray set that was parts one through eight on Blu-ray, and that's the that's the set that I have. And mm. I know that on part seven, you can watch like the cut gore scenes from um, from A New Blood. Yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, you are correct. That is also included on this set. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Are they working them into the movie? You think, or is it going to be a special feature? They seem to list them as special features. Um, yeah. If it's if it's specified as a as a as an actual cut into the film, then it's they mark it on the uncut version. Do they? And uh, yeah, so that's it. Does not seem to be the case. And sometimes I understand in some cases why that is done. Part of it's I think it's a quality reason. Quality, um, sure. Yeah, because I mean, God, uh, there was a film my dad and I watched the other day, uh, and we realized that they had had to hack the goddamn thing from so many different sources that like was it scalps. Uh, no, it was, uh, that's um, what I think of. 
God, I'm trying to remember what this was. It was just a few days. It's just like a week ago. And it was like, even like at real changes, um, you know, there were times where they were just having to stitch the damn thing together. And it was, it was like shocking. Um, yeah, it was, uh, God, what the hell was it? I can't remember now. I, I'm getting distracted because I just watched Francesca for the first time the other day. So that's been oh. on my mind. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I know that, um, that scouts the blu-ray release of that the when fred olin ray i think he even produced the the release the blu-ray release of it it's not the not the best but uh the only version of the the like gore scenes the only like non-cut uh version of scalps that has ever survived was a uh, big box vhs that was released in the 80s and for all of the the gore scenes, uh, the really detailed ones, they had to splice in from uh, from a VHS, from like the best quality VHS that they could find, and you can really tell. But um, I don't know. I kind I kind of prefer that. I would have been sad if it was the cut version of Scalps, mm-hmm. and then you go to the special features and watch the gore scenes. Like I'll take the bad quality. I think actually um, Shriek Show did that with. Um, their release of zombie three as well mm. you can tell what when it's like the cut scenes it's like pretty bad quality so i i prefer that i prefer it yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> no no totally um and i just remember which one it was it was uh four flies on gray velvet that was the oh. one that had the weird splices yeah that's a great movie that's a oh, great man Th- that was my first that was my first time seeing it and uh holy shit yeah, because uh, Hilt- Hiltner was bugging me about that for ages. Our buddy Brian Hiltner was telling me it's like the scene in the hedges. You got to You have to mm-hmm. see this film. And and I understand why, because, um, you know, my, my script, The Killer Has Emerald Eyes, um, there's definitely some similarities, not not like overtly so, but definitely you can you can see Argento at writing that movie and me writing mine was there was we were, you know, simpatico. Yeah. Uh, but um, OK, one last thing about the Friday the 13th uh, Blu-ray set. Um, it does indeed include a Blu-ray 3D version of Friday the 13th Part 3. So if you have a capable 3D TV and 3D Blu-ray player, which is the PS4, PlayStation 4 does do 3D Blu-rays. Oh, wow. Um, you, you can watch that. That's awesome. Yeah, I think on on uh, the the Blu-ray set that I have, it's the actual like red and blue. You have an option to watch a 3D version, and it comes with Jason 3D glasses. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's that's kind so of much, a and it's more compatible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of a headache to watch. Uh, yeah. I never, did you ever, I never watch it. <laughs> this is t- the total side side note. But did you ever get a chance to see the, the uh, 3D movies they played at the Guild Theater in Portland? No. Because, uh, yeah, I got to see Christopher in the Black Lagoon, and uh, it came from outer space. Mm. They uh, they play that as a double feature on a Saturday afternoon. My parents like were like, you have to see this. It's like, first of all, you have to. My parents were both like, you have to see Christopher in the Black Lagoon. And number two, it's a 3D movie in an old, in a theater that we went to when we were dating. You have to come see this. Right. You have to come with us. So, because when awesome. my parents date, yeah, when my parents were dating, the, the Guild Theater in Portland was where they went and saw the... Um, uh, brain, uh, Alfred Hitchcock film festival where they played like almost every single Alfred Hitchcock movie for like over the course of like four weeks. And so they saw a bunch of them together there, but yeah, anyway, so I think that covers most of the Blu-ray news. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. Well, okay. I do have a segue that will talk about one more other thing. If I may mm-hmm. of all the things to get 4k Blu-ray releases, which of which, um, some new ones have come out recently. Uh, that are more in this vein of you know our wonderful grindhousey schlock and such, which is that Blue Underground seems to have fired the first shot, and there's a release of New York Ripper and House by the Cemetery each in 4K. Um, yeah, which I, 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 I think those are a little bit old because I have I have both of those Go ahead. from Blue Underground. Yeah, yeah, Blue I Underground, have, but the yeah. uh, oh okay, so was that just a re-release I was seeing because I thought those were brand new, the new. Uh, uh, 4K versions. Oh, uh, they're, I think, a couple of, I think they're a couple of months old. Um, them. Well, the, 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 the 4K Ultra HD is, um, says August 25th, 2020 mm. on uh, House by the Cemetery. Weird. Why are they doing that? Like, I, I swear to God, now I want to, like, well, I have to run all the way upstairs to my movie room. But 
Yeah, just I'm, I'm the gonna, lenticular uh, cover and everything. I did a video. Um, I don't. I don't know. I'm. I'm gonna throw the link in the chat to the Blu-ray.com review page, so you can at least check the transfer, see if it looks different, because it looks like they did a spiffy new poll of it. Holy cow! I've never seen this movie look so pretty. And this is yeah. House by the Cemetery. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I just got these. I like just like like a month ago, like when they came out. It's weird. I mean, maybe it's the, I don't know. Maybe someone will um, tell us why it's different. But yeah, I mean, the lenticular cover and everything, and it says 4K transfer, and I wonder. <sighs> wonder what the the difference is here hmm. um but okay so the thing i was going to mention is you know 4k for this type, for of, this type of genre genre stuff um, um i'm also getting okay, my voice by the way uh, coming from your side oh all right one second go for it so i was thinking about how you know with the this kind of genre, you know, fair, you know, when we we finally make the move to 4K physical media, because, you know, obviously we're the wackos that collect this stuff. We love this stuff. Like, I will happily, like, I wish I could get that 4K UHD Dawn of the Dead set, you know, that's that's out, that's coming out, um, you know. But of all the things to be getting a 4K Blu-ray set of the entire franchise, the Resident Evil movies by Paul W.S. Anderson is not what I expected to go so early. But uh, but that is coming apparently in uh, also in November. All right. Um, I mean, I have no uh, I have no huge issue with that. I guess <laughs> I'm like yeah. I mean, it's warm on it. Yeah. No, I I feel you know after all this time I feel similarly. But it just it was just one of those interesting things. But it helps segue because we were going to finish through the news that because uh, we're going to talk about a little bit of horror video game news um for those spooky folks that like uh like some a little more interactive but just you know thinking about the resident evil films just always makes me chuckle a bit it's also really fun to go to the amazon page uh for the box set that's coming out and you really see how paul anderson as a writer he can be either very direct in his scripts and plots or it takes 580 words <laughs> to to describe uh the plot of the movie because like you either have like a log line or like a paragraph and a half. It's very funny. Anyway, um, so with uh, with Calvin's permission here, I was going to bring up that. Um, so I, as I've mentioned before on the podcast, I'm I am of the nerdy variety that likes interactive entertainment, which is to say video games. And for horror, it's been interesting to see how the independent scene online for independent games has become, you know, obviously has exploded with things like Amnesia, Five Nights at Freddy's, and so on and so forth. Um, and on these, uh, the the itch.io, which is a place for, um, is really for like indie stuff in general. You can even like find people's tabletop RPG campaigns and, uh, you know, people have like, you know, I think they even have like crochet patterns up there. But anyway, uh, there's a group on there called Haunted PS1, and they did a Haunted PS1 demo disc uh, about I, I, not a year, not quite a year ago. But, but so this summer they did the Summer of Screams Game Jam, where people had from July 17th through August 31st to make a game and make a little horror game. And you can go check out their uh, their submissions. They're all up. And so the um, there's a whole bunch of them, including a couple of nice little gems. The, the gimmick is that they all feel like PlayStation 1 titles. So like original PlayStation games from like the late the mid to late 90s. Uh, so aesthetically, they have this very old school sort of look. And sometimes they look intentionally crappy. And sometimes it's, you know, just limitations of the time. But there is one which I think is going to get a laugh out of some people. It's apparently a parody-style horror game called Death Flush. Will this trip to the bathroom be your last? <laughs> and uh, it looks hilarious. It's got full voiceover, and it's got a skeleton hand coming out of a bloody toilet. So that looks like a good time. Um, but yeah, for those for those of you that want some nice, cheap entertainment, little spookiness, and um, I mean, some of these are going to be you know buggy as hell, but they're, you know... They're fun, they're cute, and it's something that I definitely, I definitely recommend. I've been playing a lot of games like this lately, and they are, uh, they're sometimes very effective. It's a good time. Yeah, I'm gonna have to check those out. I, you know, I'm not the biggest um, 
gamer. Actually, I'm not really much of a gamer at all. I, uh, I mean, I, I had never gotten a system past the PS2, but recently I was given a PS3 by my friend. Uh, I haven't even hooked it up yet, but, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but with the PS3, can't I, like, download the original Resident Evil games? That is correct. The That's first, correct. Cool. Um, so basically, on the PlayStation 3, they actually, you can get 1 through 3, Code Veronica, the remake of 1, so the GameCube remake, the one that's right. really super, you know, the the pretty one. You might be able, I think you can get Resident Evil 0 as well, so I think both the GameCube ones are ported, as well as a Resident Evil 4 and 5 and 6. So basically, all of them before 7 of the main numbers you can get. You can't get, like... I won't mention what ones you can't get, but yeah, there's a lot of Resident Evil you can get. You can get the original Silent Hill. Uh, you can get Dino Crisis. Um, Sweet. Repurchased. And if you look up the PS, what PS3 mo- uh, unit you have, if you look at the serial number on the bottom, you should be able to also figure out if it can play PlayStation 1 discs, and you can also just get those like at the Retro Game Expo or whatever, you know, yeah, around town. I figured I could do that. I know that that... Uh, can be kind of tough sometimes, especially like right now with COVID, there's like nothing going on. So yeah. I didn't know how hard it would be to find like a physical copy of those, but I guarantee, I guarantee I can still beat the first three from memory. Like I know where everything is. I know I can. Um, I will say, I will say one, ca- ca- one caveat, the fucking water puzzle in Resident Evil 3, the water sample puzzle. Yes. You know the one. Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, that one, and, uh, I remember from the first one, the one that always, uh, the one that tripped me up for the longest time was the, uh, uh, the gallery room, and you actually have to, like, put them in order from birth to death. Yes. I remember. Yeah. Well, give me the peace of death, and I will give you the joy of life. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, huh? Okay. I remember, like, that one took me a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Such a such fun games. I love those. Actually, um, Outbreak File One and File Two were always like my it, it, it was my favorite for a long time. I love those. I understand it. Understandably, God, yeah, the environments are great. The monsters are great. Um, yeah, on on the Let's Play channel I work on, we've been sort of trying to figure out at some point in the future what we want to do is like because we have like four or five of us as as a group, and we want to like each take like a different scenario. So like one of us will do the flashback one with the axe murderer. One will take the hospital one. One will take the zoo one. But yeah, like that's it's it's like they're remaking Resident Evil Four, and it's like guys, just go remake Outbreak for fuck's sake. Yeah, yeah, and it's just a good format where it's like levels and you can have different characters uh and and each character has their own specialty you know like i always play as the uh the asian girl who has the backpack just because she can carry more stuff Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's a really fun game That, that one was my favorite nice well uh time to move on to our featured reviews yeah I All do right. believe so. All right. Well, first up on the list is uh, kind of the uh, the the birthday boy, I guess. Uh, Bruno Mattei's Cruel Jaws, which has never seen an American release. Um, it, it may, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it may have never seen an official um, physical release at all because this movie was... Uh, uh, sued to hell and back this one and the last shark which is like kind of the, the prototype for this movie god the italians mm-hmm. were weird in ripping things off you know it's like they would rip off their own ripoffs which was uh sort of a weird little a, a little thing that they did but yeah. well uh, it's the to to, to get on to that is you know i've because i out of all the documentaries I've seen about Italian films, spaghetti westerns, Italian crime, etc., they always seem to cover this one idea. As a film becomes a hit, so then follows a genre based on that right. one movie. And that's the, and so even if it was the movie was a ripoff of something else, if it was successful, bam, that was it. Yeah. Right. And you saw that with Zombie. Um, and yeah, you saw that with uh, a number of a number of films, they would start ripping off oh, yeah. their own ripoffs, which was really funny. 
Well, um, I mean, that's the weird. I mean, the spaghetti western is, you know, like you see how a fistful of dollars then spawns this whole genre, but then right. the then one thing comes from that, which was like the like Django. You know, mm-hmm. as my, I mean, I I love Django, but Django is clearly like we are cashing the fuck in on fistful of dollars, and yet that spawns its own genre to the point that when Franco Nero was in other movies in Germany, they would put Django in the title because right. that was a more recognizable name than his name. Yeah, I sidebar on that, I always get a laugh uh, when when people are like, uh, Django Unchained is like my favorite movie and you go, you know, that there are like, technically like 10 other Django movies out there. <laughs> You're like what? Well, really? It's like, yeah, oh, man. God. It was like it was like Hiltner. I was having I was tr- I tried to explain to him that no, Audio Sabata is not a Sabata movie. It was right. black it's black Indian with Yul Brenner, and they retitled it. There's only technically two Sabata movies. Right. And he got mad it was like, it's like, but it's not it's not Lee Van Cleef is Sabata. And it's like, exactly. It's not supposed to be. Right. Yeah, the the boy. Uh, the Italians renaming things too is a whole other can of worms too. Right, which is one thing I would love to cover for for these reviews, and I'm gonna look this up as well. Is the alternate titles for all three of the movies that we uh, we cover today? Right, because Cruel Jaws is also known as Jaws Five. Hmm. Um, and that's I the also only thing I can think. Uh, so I looked up the list. There's another name. It is sometimes called the Beast, which okay. Um, and uh, there's also <laughs> Fauci Crudeli, Cruel Jaws in Italy, and oh. a bunch of other languages that I will not butcher. <laughs> Jesus. So, uh, yeah, Cruel Jaws is, uh, well, it's basically just Jaws. Uh, <laughs> the movie starts with uh, these divers, and they're, they're, they're diving down to a, a Navy wreckage, like a, a Navy boat that it wrecked. And, of course, they are subsequently attacked by a shark. And then from that movie on, I mean, it's almost like scene for scene Jaws. And then every now and then they kind of sprinkle in like a little scene like with um, uh, like with these these mob guys. But I, for the most part, I mean, you have the skinny dipper scene uh, mm-hmm. that, that ends with the boyfriend in the, the police station saying, like, my girlfriend was was killed by a shark. I mean, everything. You have the mayor who, you know, doesn't want to cancel. Uh, in this version, it's it's like the the uh, regatta, right? It's like windsurfing. Right. Yeah. yeah, they're going to do this regatta windsurfing. And it's the uh, it's it's a mixture of it's the mayor and it's the landowner who owns a bunch of the beachfront property. And uh which, you know, is, it's it's kind of weird, you know, I think I've, I've now watched more because of this. I've now watched more Bruno Mattei films, and it seems like he really didn't like corporate men, men in suits or any sort of authority figures, or at the very least, he knew his audience didn't. And so he made them like the biggest, like slimy douchebags he possibly could. Yeah, and that that and it's just it's it's just it's. Jaws. <laughs> it's fucking just, Jaws. It is, yeah. As much as I could, you know, as much as I could make commentary, a lot of it's just like that happened to be the case. Right. It was like, okay, this scene happens in Jaws, so we're going to do the exact same thing. And sometimes with the exact same dialogue as well. Because mm-hmm. uh, after watching this, I immediately had to watch The Last Shark and I watched Jaws. Cause wow. It, I, yeah, I was like, huh. It, it, they're like, I just wanted to see uh, like what clips they were taking. The, the like the clips that they stole in this movie and used uh, the the clips that they they used in this this film that they stole from Jaws are pretty. You can spot them pretty easily. Oh yeah. But yeah. I, I didn't really know the the shots that they took from uh, the Last Shark, and I'm guessing that they took that the whole reason that this movie has this windsurfing. Uh, competition is because in the last shark um there are two characters who are windsurfing who get attacked so i think they just already had effect scenes involving mm-hmm. windsurfers and they're like all right that's what they do on this beach <laughs> you know they have a windsurfing contest because we already have footage of that yeah because basically yeah exactly it's pretty you know um noticeable i think you know to to, to finish that thought is because the 
what's amazing about Cruel Jaws is that probably, you know, we're, we're, this is why we're bummed, by the way, folks, that Zach isn't here because Zach, you know, um, who works at Severin, who probably who from sounds of things worked on the release of this film coming up is, you know, was able to get a little dig a little deeper. But from what we can tell. All, all of the effect shots in this entire film, with maybe one exception, and, and when I say maybe it's more of like I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt that there's probably one or two they make custom for this movie, but. Everything else is from either is apparently from Jaws. Jaws two is my understanding. Uh, the Last Shark, aka Great White, by Enzo Castellari, and Deep Blood by Joe Diamato. And that's like all of this to the extent that like you actually technically get to see the shark die three times because they reuse the different shots of those death scenes at different points, but they cut around it in this very awkward sort of order. So yeah. when we say, you know, the two divers go under, under down, underground and deal with, you know, deal with the, the, the divers that's uh, underground, sorry. They end up in an underground tunnel being chased by the shark in the opening. My understanding is that is from uh, deep blood. That's the, that's the end of deep blood. And there's even a shot you can tell, even on these, you know, crappy VHS quality versions you can find, um, you can kind of see the shark go and explode for a little second, but then the next shot, it's fine, you know. Oh, so, huh? I didn't. Yeah, I didn't notice that um, from my version, but I wasn't looking for it. Now I got to go back and and see if I can spot that. I've not seen Deep Blood, actually. Yeah, not, but, neither have I. So, so it's, it's all conjecture on my side. That sort of uh, um, segues into. I know we didn't really go over the, like the the full plot. I don't know if there's much of a, a plot to get into, but, but um, it's just Jaws. Uh, yeah, it's it's just it's just Jaws. It's just Jaws. Uh, but I have a theory. I don't see it anywhere on the IMDb page or the Wikipedia page, but I think that Joe Diamato is also a producer on this film. I think that at the very least it was made through his uh, through his production company uh, at the end of the 80s into the 90s. He was kind of the like last dying gasp of the Italian genre, uh, horror genre. He produced a lot of Fulci's later films. Uh, he produced Troll 2. He produced Umberto Lenzi films like Hitcher in the Dark. And I say that because... Some of the soundtrack in this movie is library soundtrack that was owned by that production company that turns up in uh, Troll 2, it turns up in Door to Silence, and I think that it turns up in Hitcher in the Dark. And uh, that in the beginning of this movie, you see a, uh, a motorhome that's driving across this bridge. And not only is that that shot taken from Umberto Lenzi's Hitcher in the Dark, but I think that I, I'm almost positive that it is the same motorhome that's in Troll 2, and it shows up in Hitcher in the Dark. And I think that that production company, all, all of those movies, they were shot either in, like, Florida or Louisiana, and they, like, kind of all involve a, a camper, and like feature some of the same music and the fact that they're using cut scenes from deep blood it, i just something tells me that joe diamato or his production company at the time was involved with this film i In would not be way. surprised yeah i would not I, be surprised i don't know why he's not credited um but it's just it's a hunch that i have that yeah, that, yeah. okay so so i will say uh um, I'm already skimming through Deep Blood, so that's where the shots of the dog on the beach come from, and the uh, pink blood shots in the water. You know that very kind of brighter pink. Mm -hmm. It's like it's a, it's a little too. It's you can tell it's a little too pink even for even on the VHS, and it looks like it's also where the stock footage of the uh, the folks under the water uh, near the 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 seagrass is also there as well. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm folks at home. I'm I, you can find this film on YouTube. Somebody's put it up. Yeah, I mean, these are these are orphan films. I, I feel mm -hmm. a lot less guilty about them. Yep. There's that. There's that footage. OK. Yep. There's the yeah. grass. But but yeah. So basically, I mean, 
what's amazing about Cruel Jaws is how, how there were two things that came to mind when I finished the film for the first time. Was number one, I need to find out what the hell was anybody in this film involved with other than this film, and uh, and secondly, how many of them were actually Bruno. And uh, as far as I can tell, I think because like because the credits are really, 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 really um, bloated. As in, this is a, a you know a pretty much a this this is practically a porno shoot in terms of like the quality of like the lighting and the camera setups and things like that. I mean, this and is very the basic acting quality. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. No, they're, 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 God, God, there there are there are Shannon Tweed, Shannon Tweed, Carrie Wurr, and Lisa Boyle movies that have better acting. Oh my this. God, that is that is one of the notes that I had, it, and it seems like Bruno Mattei. Whenever he makes a film with American actors, he is purposefully looking for the worst actors that he can <laughs> find. Like, and they, yeah, I, I would not be surprised. It's it's incredible. Like, especially like, okay, you expect kid actors to be bad, but these kids are horrible. They, it, it's just, it's, yeah, it's mind numbing. Like how mm-hmm. bad some of these actors are in this movie. Mm-hmm. I mean, that being said, I felt the little girl in the wheelchair in this film was actually one of the more endearing actors in the film, <laughs> amazingly. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, like, what is that, that little bit? It's if the, where the two mobsters go out because they think they found a treasure map when really it's the map to the wreck where the shark is being territorial about it. And they, <laughs> and the the guys get ready to go on the water and the dude comes out and he's, he, he goes, now you be down, to, you be careful down there. That shark was trained by the Navy. You know how they are. Yeah. Well, that's the one thing that uh, isn't Jaws. That is the one spin on this movie is that it's a, uh, it's like a genetically altered great white shark or tiger shark. It's a ti- it's a tiger shark. Yeah. Which yeah, actually, the- I looked up. That's that's actually more accurate to both the geography and the lethality. Great whites often have a have more higher tendency to leave people alone. Tiger sharks apparently are far more aggressive. Right. But it's so weird that they decided to go with like this whole uh like super shark weapon created by the navy because if they never mentioned that you would have never noticed it in this movie. It doesn't, you know, have any special abilities really. And then the fact that it's like okay, this navy ship went down that was carrying this weaponized man-eating shark, and they just didn't do anything about it. Like, the Navy doesn't come back. There's not a subplot with, like, the Navy trying to capture the shark. Mm-mm. Which, it's just, which is, it, yeah, which is a bummer. That would have actually made an interesting plot point. Right. Yeah, I mean, there that could have been, like, your, your other obstacle, like our heroes, you know have to kind of uh you know also battle these uh like kind of soldier people or this big cover-up that could have given like the mayor more of like like a different way to go uh as far you know as like keeping it hush hush you know but yeah it they didn't do anything with it they did nothing with this like weaponized altered shark they, yeah. they just say it you know it's like oh by it. the way yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but it's I guess that's the thing is, you know, you have the footage you got, you have your resources. I mean, I'm still curious, like, because having not watched Deep Blood, and I'm actually going to go ahead and keep skimming through this. Like, is the set the underwater set of them planting the charges around the boat? Oh, never mind. It's it's in Deep Blood. I just found it. Yeah, that uh. whole dy- that whole dynamite scene. That's just from Deep Blood. And so they probably just tried to match the wardrobe. Yep, I just found the close-ups. It's all there from 1989, six years prior. Jesus. <laughs> oh my God! Even the shots, yeah, even some of the shots of them pulling, they oh they at least they stage it the same where they pull the guy up out of the water. Wow, it's that's fucking incredible. <laughs> we're we're through the looking glass here, people. Jeez, I mean, they really like. I mean, this really is just it's like Godzilla's revenge. But Jaws, where, you know, they just kind of, like, work in some human characters into some shots that they already had. It's it's so, so strange. You know, what? you know what? Calling it Godzilla's Revenge, I think, is too nice. No, this is Super Monster Gamera. 
This yeah, is, this is yeah. What the, yeah, this is where that's at. Apparently, there's another one of those. That's what Adam Halverson was telling me about, who we need to really get on this podcast at some point. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, <laughs> God. No, I totally agree, though. It's like, yeah, they just find some plot, you know, find some actors to, quote, unquote, act out scenes. I mean, I love how even, like, there's the scenes of the corpse uh, on the beach, which are disparate from the rest of the film. They, they, the, you never see the the body in the same shot as the the, the actors and they use a different corpse in the uh uh or no you don't even see it in the autopsy scene yeah no. so like so i mean i i wonder if like you know at most this film maybe costs like you know not even a million dollars like you know like 350k or something like that you know and then maybe like another 150,000 for for pose just to you know put the thing together do your sound editing what little there can be done i mean the the audio quality is is just you know I mean, that's why I wonder about, like, how many of these these crew positions for, like, you know, below the line. Like, I mean, this has – it lists one, two, three, uh, about eight grips. And, you know, I mean, a shoot that requires eight grips is not going to look like this. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's, you know. I, I mean, maybe maybe watching the Blu-ray transfer will will – look a bit better i mean granted i have a uh i have this movie on a bootleg dvd that i bought at a uh, horror convention uh that was super super overpriced um and and maybe it looks better (laughs) maybe there's like you know if you watch the original uh print of the film maybe it looks better maybe the blu-ray looks better but yeah it's uh, the versions that are out there are really rough looking and really yeah. just looks like they were just running and gunning this thing and you know to be fair bruno Mattei was probably the right guy to get to do mm-hmm. something like this because mm-hmm. he's not a hack um but he, but, you know, his specialty was just quick and dirty movies, you know? Yeah. There's a it's 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 kind of a bummer. Like, it doesn't have the the Coleman Francis, like, dip, like actually interesting, you know, sense of disillusionment that you get out of those films. It's not quite the ineptitude of like Attack of the Eye Creatures or the uh, or the kind of the struggling against the limitations of William Castle. But it has its own there's there is a smirk in a sense of like i know i'm ripping you off but at the very least i'm gonna you know there is enough of an effort to help you have a good time in this picture yeah i think it's an extremely fun movie like i i actually really enjoy this movie quite a bit yeah Uh, because but in a in a just like purely fun way yeah well and actually to be honest to my surprise, this is the one I was dreading because for planning for this podcast, we were originally going to do four films. And we decided to, to remove one because you were mentioning you, you'd already talk about it quite a bit and we'll probably talk about it another time. But was um, I expected Cruel Jaws to be the one I hated. It was going to be painful, like pulling teeth. I loved this one easily the most. Oh, yeah. Um, it's not my favorite of these three, but um, it's probably the second and it and I just I had a lot of fun with it. I like I love the the goofy acting in it. Like I love the the surfer bro who's like the a hole. His line oh delivery is so funny. And then when he's like unable to shoot the the shark at point blank range when they're out on the boat. <laughs> and well, then he's also trying to use trying to use fucking buckshot on a on a shark hide. I mean the yeah. best you could you can do with a twelve gauge is a slow ground, which I think you need to have you need to be a police officer to get those things. And he yeah, he's just like unable to like shoot the shark. Doesn't he like freeze up too? He like yes. he like can't even do yes. it. And then they blow up their own fucking boat, which is just the yes. greatest scene. The greatest in the movie. thing. I think because of how amazing that moment is. So when I, I, I almost, I don't want to spoil that to be honest. Exactly how they blow up the boat, mm-hmm. be, because um, I, when I rewatched the 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 film for to uh, uh, yesterday, uh, it was yesterday or two nights ago. Um, my dad and I, you know, my dad Jonica and I, we said, okay, we got to get mom to watch this. So my mother watched this film with us and you know i laughed her ass off and and also had a great time and when we got to the that explosion she was screaming like what this what 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 and it was oh it was glorious it was it's yeah it it is this is a 
this is the kind of schlock that riffs itself practically. <laughs> right. Yeah. You don't need MST3K for a movie like no. this. It, it's no. like, it's funny enough on its own, especially like the, the part that made me laugh out loud the hardest was like the family that comes up and they're like, they're talking, it's just one oh, scene. The, the, yeah. The and, Australians, right? Well, where yeah. Where they're like, oh, we came to see that shark that's eating people. And the cop is like, nope, there's no shark here. And the kid says something like, daddy, I thought we were going to see a shark. And the dad slaps him. He's like, shut up and slaps right. his son. And I I was dying, dude. That, <laughs> that part is so fucking funny. And it comes out of nowhere. It does. And I love that he also, he hits at his kid where obviously they had to use the foley to sell it because this that you can tell if that really is his son which it, it's actually quite possible it isn't but he's he would never it's the kind of guy who would never strike a child so he has no idea how to like follow through on a punch right it, and so it there's like, like he just taps him on the side of the head yeah just like rough like he he barely like gets you know touches his hair like you uh -huh. know and, and this and this is the mid 90s so everyone's got poofy hair oh and that fucking guy has got even a fanny pack and everything right yeah. he's got the, he's <laughs> yeah. got the tourist shirt the neon uh the neon swim trunks and a fanny pack <laughs> oh it's the movie that keeps on giving the more you think about it <laughs> This movie, man, and I love that the um, isn't it the guy who like owns the water park, and he looks exactly like Hulk Hogan. He does, yeah. Dude, and the whole I, fucking movie. That's what I kept thinking. Yes, and I love his increases in like his son ups and downs of tone. Like he does that whole thing of like, yeah, you know, it was the uh, it was the it's like, well, you know, I went through the worst part of my life. I lost my wife. Uh, my daughter couldn't. It was it uh, lost my job. Wife died, and then the worst of all, Susie's smile went away. It's like something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh. it's a. Yeah, they're they're. I mean, when it comes to Bruno's films, I, I have I have now learned the hard way, as we'll get to when we get to one of the, the one of the other ones here. Um, there's there often is an element of you might need to be X amount intoxicated before going on this ride. You can watch Cruel Jaws completely dead sober and it's still funny and it's still a ton of fun. Yes, I agree. I agree. Although, yeah, it, you know, if you do live in a legal state, I would definitely recommend it because this movie will have you dying of laughter if you are stoned, man. This this movie is such a treat, and I want it. I want to get it on Blu-ray, but like I said earlier, um, I spent so much on that that goddamn bootleg, so I don't think I could get rid of it, even if I get the the Blu-ray. Hmm. 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 That's it's between a rock and a hard place there. Oh boy, is that is that about it for Cruel Jaws? I think so. I, although I did want, want to say, um, I I do love the moment when you know you're watching the credits of this film, and like I said, I mean, I I don't buy it for a second. When you go to IMDb, like most of the people that that quote unquote worked on this movie, this is their only credit. So he could have hired amateurs. It could be that people took their names off of it. So all the names are fake. But, you know, he did actually have a sizable like seven or ten person crew. Um, however, um, I love at the end of the credits, it says directed by William Snyder. It's like, we see you, Bruno. We fucking yeah. see you. Don't don't you try that, Vincent Dawn. Oh, he yeah, he, he always. Well, they always do that. They're always like trying yeah. to find a very American name. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I know that it's a, I guess what I'm saying is like, he didn't even use Vizen Dawn, he used a different name and it's like, no, no, it's got, it's got the, uh, the, the wonderful, I mean, this is, I know a McDonald's hamburger when I smell it, Mr. Mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this, God, this movie, I'm trying to think if there was anything else really that I wanted to mention about it. Cause yeah, I don't want to give anything away. I just, I, I, People should watch this movie. People should buy the Blu-ray of this film. Um, that YouTube, I did check out the YouTube version that's out. It's got like Japanese subtitles and yeah, um, it's pretty bad. I mean, I thought that my yeah. bootleg version was bad, but yeah, the version on YouTube is pretty awful. Yeah, it's it's oh, it's pretty it's pretty disgusting. Yeah, but it was it's what I had to work with. But uh, the one last thing, I I. 
this is like one of those like I would love to sick this movie on people who have no idea and not set them up for anything, right? Just sit them down and say you're gonna watch a cheesy shark movie, you know, where it, it, it's it's all the uh, you know it's got all the stock footage and everything, and then wait for the reaction to the Star Wars music. Comes in at that oh, one yes. point. Yes, yes, that that is another thing that just completely. I remember the first time watching this, I was like, is that is that really in this movie or is that just this bootleg? So I'm glad that it's also on the YouTube version because once again, I was not sure if that was like actually part of the movie, like the original cut of this movie, having like the first beginning of, of the Star Wars theme. Mm-hmm. It's so like, yeah, it's, it's like 10 seconds, but it's there. Yeah. And it's it's like the most iconic part of that song, too. Like the swell, the beginning swell of, <laughs> of the Star Wars theme. Oh, God. Yeah, yep. totally. For, uh, yeah, I forgot. I forgot about that. Forgot to mention that. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, they I've... use Troll 2 music and they rip off Star Wars music. So yep. There you go. I also want to mention one last piece of trivia. The Theater of the Sea, which is reportedly where the dolphin, you know, the uh, the tourist attraction is is shot. It is still open in Elaz uh, Morada, Florida, to this day. I mean, it's closed now, obviously, but the the business still is running twenty five years later. So, wow. so you know, you can go you can go down there, and I mean, who knows? Maybe Hulk, the Hulk Hogan guy still works there. Who knows? Yeah. Oh, and I guess I will mention. <laughs> I I do I. Like the ending of this movie always makes me go, what, 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 what just happened? Because it's like they blow up the shark. Spoiler alert! Of course they kill the shark, but then it's like the evil mayor is still alive, and it has this like slapstick, like PG kid friendly ending with like the with like him being pushed into the water by the seal, and then it like the movie just ends with goofy Hulk Hogan guy. La- like with this ridiculous laugh like the most unnatural laugh i've ever seen it's mm-hmm. like it's it's just so bizarre like the movie when it just wraps itself up it's so quick and it cuts around and it like yeah it's like boom shark's dead weird laugh the end it, it's so weird the editing in this movie is so strange yep yeah it's it is it is a thing to behold and it's a thing to uh it is a thing to enjoy. <laughs> yes, I, I highly recommend this movie. It is not my favorite, but uh, now that we're talking about it, it may be the most enjoyable. Yeah, like it's the for sure. it's it's the one that is probably the least boring because of how funny it is. Mm-hmm. All right, moving on. So, second movie we got up here is another Bruno Mattei film. And it is Shocking Dark, a.k.a. Terminator 2, The Balls. The Balls on Bruno Mattei and the infamous Claudio Fragasso of Troll 2 fame to make a movie that they titled Terminator 2. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the chutzpah. I mean, that's, that's here. I mean, it's... And, and not only that, to then basically because uh, i love that this is a it's an alien ripoff it's a terminator rip uh, sorry it's an aliens ripoff a terminator ripoff and um it has like regarding aliens it has direct scenes even oh, like shot like lifted shot for shot um yeah th- th- this movie is fucking horrible <laughs> <laughs> I had so many problems watching sitting through this. Really? This is my favorite. This is probably yeah. my favorite movie of the three. Mo- mostly because I- I'll do this thing where I'll watch a movie and I'll go, man, I wish that I had owned this movie when I was like 11 because I would have absolutely adored this film when I was a kid. There's something about it. It. I love the goofy creatures. I love the goofy costumes. Which, it's so funny with how many times I've seen this movie, and, you know, you do see the creatures in this Mm -hmm. film, but I don't know if I could, like, draw you a picture or detail what they look like. Like, I don't really know. 
I don't really it, know what they look like. They're just like blob. They kind of like smog monster blob. Right. You know, they're kind of yeah. There's a little bit smog monster blob. A little bit reminds me of the uh, there's that robot and robot holocaust, and a little bit like some of the aliens in like. Uh, it reminds me of like a little bit of the adult monsters in uh, adult aliens in uh, Pod People in a way. That kind of like the, yeah. the, head, the heads are a little too pointy, you know. Like they're they're not quite a cone head, but they're kind of there, you know. But they're kind of squishy and yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of cartilage involved and yeah. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes they have like uh, Party City spider webs on them, which oh, yeah. is real strange. Like, what the fuck do the, the do spider webs have to do with these creatures? Um, and this is this is one of those movies where I've seen it a lot. I have the Severin Blu-ray, um, and I really, really like this movie. I really enjoy it. It's a good popcorn flick. But still, like when I was when I was thinking about it and thinking about doing this podcast. I don't know, like, if I can detail the plot, really. Because it's, like, there's so many instances of, like, why? Why does that happen? They're just, it's, like, okay, there's, like, Venice is polluted. Mm -hmm. It takes place in the future, and Venice is polluted. And then it's just, like, okay, this, this, like, uh, commando squad is going down to this kind of, like, umbrella corporation style uh, mm-hmm. uh yeah the secret secret base lab. yeah I, yeah and it's like wait what 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 are they really going there for just because like they didn't does that like you figure out later that it has has something to do with venice being polluted but at the time you don't really know that right or am i wrong <laughs> like, i'm pretty sure it gets detailed in the beginning that the uh the reason why the the do- uh, doctor doctor um dr sarah is sent in is because um the plan was that they had created a facility to decontaminate the water of venice that had des- essentially destroyed the city and made it unlivable and there were I, I don't remember if there were people that were explicitly still caught up in the city or if they had completely evacuated it, because I think the concern is that by being so overtly polluted, it will eventually start to pollute more and more of the country. And right. so their efforts to contain the pollution and contain this spread of bacteria and other pollutants and other goop and gunk and stuff. And that's the thing is, I mean, people, you know, and this is I think people that aren't familiar with Venice's history. I mean, it's a polluted place like it's been right. it's. As my understanding is it has not been safe to swim in the Venice canals for hundreds of years um, because of how developed the city has been since, you know, the, before even before the Renaissance, you know, and and it's and also it's it's a swamp. It's I mean, it's more of a swamp than it is necessarily a river. And so even though the water can look very clean in places, it can, it can be clean in places. It's a, you know. It's it's a dirty city and it's a city. You know, I mean, you've got stone, you've got mud, you've got you know people taking a shit in the water. Right. You know, um, and so that's like the theme they're kind of going for. And then it becomes basically aliens, which is that something's gone wrong. There is a monster or infection that has started to spread through the facility. They send it in, and it, the company man um, Christopher Ahrens who uh, plays a character named Samuel Fuller, which he says with much gusto. Right. <laughs> um, which I got a big laugh out of, out of now because I'm a much bigger Sam Fuller fan than I was when I probably would have seen this movie as a kid. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, the, you know, he's sent in as the company representative who is actually there to essentially, because, okay, there's two different things that end up coming out in the third act. There right. is the fact, there is the <laughs> fact that, they are it's the company's plan is actually to accelerate the pollution and kill off the land and sell it for cheap and destroy the city so that you know the, anyone who's quarantined within the zone dies and that they sell all the real estate number 2 is that for some reason this rich capitalist bunch of assholes have a fucking time machine escape pod yes and and like the the research on on making monsters out of organisms like it's like how does that how the fuck is this all supposed to factor into the same company and then they figure <laughs> out that the company is actually the ones who polluted Venice but in the beginning mm-hmm. of the movie they think that the company is was like started to unpollute Venice and it's 
it's so weird and kind of skipping ahead. It's so funny because there is a line that uh, that that our uh, Terminator uh, rip off uh, also um, aliens. I forget that character's name rip off who works for the company. Uh, oh, the Paul, uh, Paul Reiser's character. Yeah. Uh, Paul Reiser's Burke, character. Burke. Burke. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that character, uh, Mr. Samuel Fuller, right. Uh, right. <laughs> he has this line at the, at the end of the movie where they're like, they, I think they figure out that he's an Android or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, they're like, what? Why didn't you tell us? And he was like, I was just waiting for the right time. And that's like, right. Oh and man. I it's so fun. I that always makes me laugh. It's like, yeah, you mean like uh the end of the movie? So you can like shoehorn more plots in? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that's why they didn't tell anyone. Like you could like I swear to God, Claudio Fragasso wrote this script, him and his wife. And I they must have been so high when they were making this. <laughs> they, they did not give a shit. They're just like, okay, he's an android now. Why? I don't know. He was just waiting for the right time. Like, they don't care about writing themselves into a corner or introducing new plot points. Like, this movie is so fucking confused. And no matter how many times I've seen it, I still find myself going, wait, okay, why? Why are the, the why are they here? Or, why are these monsters here? What what was the company doing with these monsters again? Was this did this just have nothing to do with the Venice thing? It's just serendipitous that they like uh, broke out and started killing people. It's so bizarre. The whole movie is bizarre. It is. It it is a. That's the reason why I'm so bummed that I don't. It's. I wonder if I, I'm going to enjoy this movie later when the sting of it being this fucking silly and low quality and, and also just a waste of resources. Like they have so many great locations and great props and good monsters. And I mean, the fuck ton of pyro and spark effects for the uh, the Terminator stuff at the end. I mean, God damn, they, uh, you know, this was not a cheap little, you know, this was, you know, we're talking the same director as cruel jaws, but this is not cruel jaws. I mean, this is no, not at all budget. And the, the action is like pretty good. I think, like the you know anytime they have like their like battle shotguns moments with the with the monsters like I think all of that is really cool. Like I said, is that as like an eleven year old, I would have loved this movie. Exactly. Was, no, I, I I felt the same way. There was like a window, you know. Mhm. Mhm. And I, you know, it's just yeah. When you think of it, it's like like from a filmmaking or a storytelling standpoint is where you just like start like laughing uncontrollably or you know you'll be incredibly frustrated with this movie i mean there's just like so many strange little moments like where where greta rosemary like just randomly in the middle of this tense moment like stops and pulls out a postcard of old venice and gives Mm -hmm. it to the other soldier and she's the look at this it's venice Oh, you can keep that one. Really? Thanks. It's like this weird, like, why? Why is that Mm -hmm. there to remind us to make you go, oh, remember, Venice is polluted. But it, like, doesn't really factor into the overall movie all that much. Mm -mm. Right? Like, the pollution, like, whether or not Venice was polluted kind of, it doesn't really do anything for the plot. It could have been absent. And the rest of the movie could have still gone on. Well, <laughs> it's it, so it, weird. I mean, I liken it in some respects to the, the one of my favorite um, Albert Pune movies, even though, I mean, God, even just saying a favorite Albert Pune movie in some circles would probably get me kicked out of the room. But um, but that's but that's why we have this podcast. And Adrenaline Fear the Rush is uh, – that's the one with Christopher Lambert and Natasha Henstridge. And it's very much the same setup of like – it's an area that's got some sort of chaos going on, and here, and in that case, it's I think it's like there's a mil- there's there's experiments, but it's like a little bit of pollution. It's mostly an immigration problem, and even though it's supposed to be like this neighborhood off the coast of uh, on the coast of New York State or something, or it's like you know near Manhattan Island, um, it's clearly all shot in Spain or Bulgaria somewhere, and um, and there it just focuses on the 
re- just get them in this in the space into an underground catacombs and inside this old building and just go with a monster movie. And it doesn't fuck around with that. And here it's just interesting that they keep coming back to this Venice thing and like and and really, you know, they got some pretty good footage of Venice in the beginning and the end of the movie. So they, you know, they actually went to the trouble to get some footage there. So it's like, OK, they're trying to, like, put a little bit of something in the middle to, like, tie it together. But, you know, give it a little, like, yeah, a little commentary that uh, falls flat. I mean, I don't you know, it's like, OK, this is an anti anti pollution movie. It's got it's an anti anti-pollution, anti-pollution message to it. Yeah, maybe, possibly. Maybe. You know. <laughs> maybe. I don't know where they're going with it. Oh my god. But it's so much fun. I do love the dialogue. Greta Rosemary is like one of the best uh reoccurring uh Italian actors, actresses. So I yeah, love her she's... in Demons, I love her yeah. in uh, uh Murder Rock, and then this is maybe maybe has some of her best dialogue in it. I love her first line in this movie and she delivers it right to the camera lens where she's like, all right, you bunch of pussies. It's yep. so weird. Like she's like playing the, the badass commando. And then she like throws out all of these like Italian racial slurs. That was weird. That was Being so weird. weird. And, and then, and then like the weird high five thing, the, the bit of great. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm going back to the film a little bit and there's like a little bit of grab ass. There's her and the surfer dude. Um, right. her handling the shotgun as if it's like, wow, this is really nice. And it's like, yeah, it's a Mossberg from the yeah. mid 1980s, like whoopty shit, <laughs> you know, um, which always, I, you know, I, I'm not a gun person, but I know I knew a lot about guns at the time that I would have been fucking crazy about this movie if I had seen it years ago. Right. So it's like, yeah. I, I it's... always, I always laugh when it's like this super special shotgun or the super special weapons. And it's like, it's. You can you can go buy that at a hunting goods store. Yeah, it's like probably not the the best gun for every person in this like commando team to have. Like no one's got a rifle. Yep. You know, it's like you've all just got shotguns. That's probably not the best move. Nope, and not for a place that's tunnels. If you're going into like a uh, like a tenement building, I mean, yeah, right. no, that, that, I mean that's that's fine, you know. Or like in the old west when you know you're you're uh, in the small in the town in the village you know and you've got you know your coach gun that's you know it's like you just you know the the range is okay but like these yeah know, relatively short thinking. yeah the pistol grip 12 gauges with buckshot in them from a distance not really going to do much but yeah anyway and but yeah they, once again it's like there's another thing with with the movie where it's like the team is going in it's like i get i, I guess they do they they expect that something has gone wrong down there but it's like they, they don't know that there are like monsters or alien like our Ripley character, Sarah, like doesn't have any knowledge like Ripley does in aliens. Right. In that it's like, oh, there's there. I've seen these things. Mm-hmm. Right. Like no one really knows what's down there. So it's kind of weird that they send in this like paramilitary team. It's so like strange. There's just like a lot of like leaps you have to make with this movie where you just like or accept it like accept that this is what's going on because you're not going to find like any good reasoning for why these why any of these events are actually happening yeah because like uh, there's other films that you know these other ripoffs i mean and other um other kinds of films of this nature where like hell of the living dead has the elements of the, the, the unrest and the chemical factory and that's set up in the opening scene, you know, and that these different power plants are causing this toxin to happen all over the right. world, you know, it's so you, explained pretty well. Exactly. It, and, I, I think that, that movie is explained pretty damn well, actually better than once the, I, I fucking love this movie and we were going to talk about it. I've talked about it so much. I, I fucking love that movie. <laughs> but yeah, I think that it like has one of the like most explained setups of like any zombie movie. Like they go in, you know, it's like we we get all of that. Like, oh, it's this, you know, this research thing and there's a chemical spill and we see how the chemical spill happened and mm-hmm. how quickly it affects people. It's like, yeah. But with this one, nothing, really. You don't get they go down there and then they like find a computer which, by the way, the name of the the company. You remember the name of the? I you know I can't I can't remember for some fucking reason because I remember I remember 
noticing it and, and chuckling, but I don't remember what it was. It's the Tubular Corporation. God damn it, that's what it fucking was. T- yeah, I remember. That's right. The tr- <laughs> yeah, my dad and I exchanged a look like, dude. <laughs> yeah, and, and like it's it's like wait a second, did they did Claudio Fragasso like not know that because this is the '80s, so Tubular was like at the height of its popularity, slang wise, right? Yeah, Tubular, bro. It's so weird. I, I could not get over that. Every time I watch this movie, I'm like, the tubular corporation, huh? <laughs> That's the one you're going to go with. Man. Oh, God. I I feel really disappointed in myself, most of all, that I don't like this movie more. Cause I And I really was like, I was bummed when after I finished this. Because it's like, I was thinking this should be the movie that I love. Because, I mean, I'm a Resident Evil fan. I'm an old school. Mm-hmm. I mean, I... As a, as a gift for myself for my birthday, I did a whole Let's Play of uh, the original Resident Evil, you know, and did that over my birthday week, you know, a few weeks ago. And that was like, th- this is this should be my jam. This should be the thing that like, you know, that the inner 14 year old or 10 year old in me is like going, oh, my God, this is so cool. And I just couldn't get past it for some reason. And it, and it bums me out. Like, I love how dopey the actors are. It's another case oh, of like, yeah. you know, I mean, like the you know, it's a. um you know, and I like the costume design. I like the gun. It's really well lit. The lighting is super fucking yeah. good. Well, it's interesting and, when they do like they do certain lighting that looks great. Like anytime there's like the tunnels and they're mm-hmm. backlit, I think it looks super cool. But then there are scenes that are like overlit, which is like a little strange. Oh yeah, like the uh, the lab areas and the yeah. commands. The, the the home base command center is really bad in that regard. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, totally. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's it's the kind of movie that I think I will enjoy more when the pandemic's over and for whatever reason they play at the Hollywood theater and just go with a bunch of people that are mm-hmm. just totally in for something goofy. But it's like I just couldn't get past that they stole direct like not just a line but like exchanges. Oh yeah. From from uh from aliens i mean it's it's bad it's it is the case of where you know as we've we were saying you know this as far as we know this never really got a release stateside for a long time uh i believe if i can quit, just double check the wikipedia page um up until 2018 the film had never been released on video in the united states for legal reasons it was released in such countries as japan brazil and the famous the film's native country of italy yeah. and then seven released it under the title under the shocking dark title in 2018 I mean, understandably so. I mean, I'm I'm amazed. And and my my dad made a funny point about this that he kind of because I was thinking like why the fuck didn't James Cameron do it? and why didn't Fox do? It? And my dad wonders like, you know, with the whole Terminator thing with Harlan Ellison, maybe Jim looked at this and just kind of went, "Eh, let him have it." <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because the it's so weird that they went with the Terminator 2 angle because th- there's very little of Terminator that they ripped off. Mm -hmm. actually except for just the look right of him when he like has his face missing at the very end of the movie i mean they they kind of wrap up the aliens storyline and then the last 10 minutes is like oh okay about almost a half hour actually yeah is it is it really it goes quick i'm i I mean, I, yeah. I'm uh, I'm I'm scrolling back through the film because you know I didn't have enough time to make notes because I've been busy. So yeah, uh, he starts going after them and gets electrocuted at an hour and eight of an hour and thirty. Oh wow, yeah, okay, so yeah, good like twenty minutes of it turns into Terminator, sort of. You know, I mean, I don't even really see. Yeah, I I don't know about. Um, James Cameron necessarily suing them except for the title. I mean, mm-hmm. it, you know, but yeah, I could see Fox suing them over the aliens shit. Yeah. Because it's, oh, it's yeah. just direct rip off, uh, and, like scene and, for scene. And Fox was infamous for that shit in the nineties. Yeah. Cause I mean, like you remember the old aliens total conversion for doom, you know, took years right. to be re-released because, you know, they were like, Nope. I mean, that was a term in uh, in the old gaming mod uh, groups of like Quake and Doom and stuff like that, is that if you did something based on another property and you got a cease and desist for it, um, that was called getting foxed. That was uh, oh. that was actually a, that was a well-known term in those circles. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, this this movie I just don't think was like worth anyone's time to really sue. <laughs> you just stop them from releasing it somewhere. But I, I feel bad for any Italian uh, who saw the first Terminator and then went and saw this movie thinking that it was a, a an actual sequel. Yeah. Because, oh, boy. I mean, yeah. Yeah. There's no Terminator in it except for the last 20 minutes. And he's yep. barely a Terminator. Barely, barely. a Terminator. Yeah. Um, he's, he's definitely not German or Austrian enough. Yeah, no, and he's not big and hulking. He doesn't do anything impressive. He just walks around. Also, with... just walks around. I mean, he he survives getting electrocuted like once or twice. You know, right? He survives a fall, I think. Yeah, yeah. But there's a fall. Yeah. He's not very like physically opposing or anything. You know, he's got like a little piece of his face missing, but yeah, he's barely a Terminator. He doesn't even kill anybody. Oh, wait, no, he does. He does. No, he does. See, I'm pretty That's sure he gets, right. a, he gets he gets at least one. But like, yeah, yeah, like he doesn't even fight with the monsters. Like, you know, I would have loved to have seen him get surrounded right. by like even just two of them, like a two on one. And he just like devastates them. That would have been awesome. Right. Yeah. And like it, his motivation is weird, too. Like, it's like, OK, he goes down there to say self destruct like hit the self-destruct button on the facility for reasons not yes. right i can't really remember what those reasons he's like oh yeah i came here to like blow it up and it's like well if you're a terminator he probably he probably could have done that himself right like mm-hmm. he wouldn't be concerned about the monsters why do you have to go down there with the military team why did they do any of that <laughs> why does it why does he enlist the help of these people if he could have just like gone down there and done it by himself he's a machine he could take care yep. of the monsters so weird that's what yep. i was saying about like that line where uh the the uh sarah character says why didn't you tell us before because i was waiting for the right time oh, so man. Ridiculous. uh but i would like to mention that the uh the actress who plays sarah our Ripley, um, she she oddly looks like Molly Ringwald to me. I don't know why. Hmm. I know she's not a dead ringer for her, but every time I watch it, I'm like, she has Molly Ringwald vibes. Something about her. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, That's it, it. Reminds me of something, but I can't remember what. It was like an actress I remember from like some B movie in the '90s because it really? it's a face that reminds me of something i saw on television i don't know like samantha mathis or something yeah um but uh she but yeah she, she's awful by the way this actress is awful yeah um, she she does she does try i give her ever you know give her credit for that and that's a case of you know at some point you have to remember that it's the director's job to really try to get that out of them and some actors that can't you some actors, i don't think and, any of these people other than greta rosemary like who Everybody, except for, um, oh gosh, uh, one of the Italian guys who's the paramilitary. Guy. Oh, with the, the Fausto Lombardi or Tony he's, Lombardo? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's got to be him, right? Mm. He's he's in some other uh, good. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he's in After Death. That's right. That's where I know him from. He's in After Death. Um, yeah, he's in Rats, Knights of Terror. Okay. Because, like, I knew I knew his face. I think he might also be in Hell of the Living Dead, uh, if I'm not. It doesn't, it doesn't say credited, but, I mean, at the same time, maybe that's, you know, maybe he's, he took his name off of it somehow. But Yeah, he, um, he, he pops up uh, a couple times here and there. Um, he's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, hell, he was good. In, he was good enough to end up in a uh, a Tom Tekver film from 2002, which is one of my favorite Tom Tekver oh. films, Heaven. That's the one with uh, Cl- uh, Kate Blanchett as the bomber. Oh, yeah, I like, but everybody else. I mean, especially um, uh, the guy who plays Sam Fuller. What's his name? Christopher Arns. Yeah, is Arns he... or Aaron's. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. Oh. He did a bunch of stuff too, or not a bunch. Yeah. Of stuff. But stuff he did stuff that's that's the nicest way we can put it he did he was in things yeah uh he's he has that scene where he's like typing on the computer 
And he's like, oh, my God, these creatures are made from organisms that it's like a floppy disk for humans, I think is what he said. It's like, oh, Oh my God. God. You can tell that Uh. he's just like looking at the script that's like taped to the computer screen. (laughs) It's so bad. And then the little girl is awful, too. Oh, yeah. And like I hate hating on on little kid actors, but boy, she's. She's also like Italian, maybe, um, because she she pronounces what's I, I swear to God, um, what what does she say? She I think first off she always says scared, she never says mm-hmm. scared, and she says it's it like scared, yeah. She says it a million times, but there's I swear to God there's a scene where she's like I don't want to, I'm scared, like I, she must be Italian, yeah, and she can just speak English. You know, and she speaks English pretty well, but oh my God, she's just, and to be fair, they don't have anything for her to do. You can tell that they're like, just keep screaming, just keep saying you're scared. And I, that's what she does the entire movie. You know, at least Newt had like things to do in Aliens and mm-hmm. was pretty good and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, gave them like some information this this little girl does nothing. Nope. She just screams. It's awful. Yep. yep. I mean, it's it's you know the it reminds me of you know we had the conversation and the uh, the Giovanni Frezza you know uh, right pod about how people hate kids in in horror films, and this is one of those cases where it's not that we're hating on the kid you know for being a kid. It's that the character has nothing to do and the actor isn't able to do anything with it either. You know, and it's uh, and so, you know, again, that's a bit of issue of, you know, it's director, it's writer, it's actor. It's like when all and that's, I guess, my frustration with this movie is that it's the combination of all of those things just kind of creates certain situations in the film that just great on me, where in other films I would forgive them. But just be, because, you know, it was usually one or two of the three, you know, but here it's all three of those factors kind of in play. And with this kid character like Newt is an interesting in- engaging character you know she's an endearing survivor and admittedly i think she does work as a character better when she doesn't talk too much i think that when she when she speaks it's it kind of ruins a little bit of that sort of aggression you know sort of thing because it's a because i think the catch is is that you know it's how does a child sound when they say those things even though the meaning might be truthful um you know i mean like it's it's very rare to see intense movies you know very violent films that have uh kid actors doing well like city of gods like one of the only ones i can think of which is just fucking terrifying you right. know with the way the kid actors are another one similarly is uh sin nombre the nameless which uh um has one of the most like grueling murder scenes where a kid has to murder a man um kids like nine you know eight or nine years old and they're just a fucking mess at the end of the scene and it's like that's a really strong moment yeah but, like and this kind of film it's like oh god you're just you're just thinking it's like nothing like nothing's being sold here, like in, you know, in terms of like trying to sell the effect of the moment or what have you. And that's why I feel bummed out is that it's like, you have this great lighting, you have great costumes, you have, you know, interesting faces, you know, you have the archetypes there, you have the setup there, even the idea of, okay, we're going to take a little bit of Terminator, a little bit of aliens. That's not a bad idea. That's a no. great idea. That's a great idea. Um, but it just, it just does. I wish it worked better for me. I'm wondering if like, I'm going to come back to this in five years and I'm going to love it to pieces and, yeah. and that, but I don't know. It just, oddly, it just it, oddly it's, it's my favorite of the bunch, even though there's so many things wrong with it. Boy, I love this movie. <laughs> right on. Yeah. That's it's, it just, it is what it is, but you know, but yeah. that being said, um, for those at home, um, you know, you can find this on, uh, I, I believe film rise has the, uh, no, not, sorry, not film rise. Film rise has contamination. Um, but it is currently on Amazon prime in the U S yes. and, uh, the transfer looks gorgeous. So if you have a good TV or a projector system, like we do, um, it's, it's beautiful. Go watch that. Uh, this is, I'll put it to it also this way about in terms of the quality and how it's difficult for me to forgive it. Unfortunately, as I've made clear, I don't drink, I don't imbibe. I, I, I am, and it's a case of, I think I'm too sober for this movie. And sadly, given the circumstances of my life, I will always be too sober for this movie. Possibly. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not 
much of a drinker either, but uh, yeah, I, I I do partake in a little bit of uh, a little bit of the Mary Jane, especially if there's a goofy movie on. I got nothing better to do at night. Uh, that once again, I think that's uh, uh, probably a common theme with all three of these movies. Is it's like, yeah, you might not want to be stone cold sober going into this because it might let you down. It might. But uh, it's it's fun. You mentioned the Hollywood theater, and this would be like the perfect movie for their Grindhouse Festival. Exactly. This would be especially so those, much fun. Especially the all night horror marathons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this would be a great one. This is one that that I mean would have the crowd howling. Mm-hmm. You know, people would really dig it. I I feel like I think it would. I think yeah, it would benefit seeing this one with a lot of people rather than just kind of by yourself or, you know, uh, trying to like take it all in as as uh, a serious piece of cinema. Um, mm-hmm. It's much more of just like a t- switch your brain off and and have fun with it type of movie. I, I will mention I, one more thing. I love the music in this movie. I think the music is done really well. Music is good. Okay, I will. I will definitely give it that. I like the music. Yeah. Cool. All Got right. Anything else on Shocking Dark? I don't think so. There was one thing: is that there's a guy in the command center, and I'm curious if you've spotted this. The dude. I looked it up. It's not him, but it looks like Frank Ashmore, the lead from Parts: The Clone Is Horror, and it I, keeps yeah. freaking me. You said that, and I didn't. I didn't know who you were talking about when you sent me that message. You just said, "Oh, the the guy from parts the the clone of right, right. And uh, yeah, I was and looking I go- for who you were talking about, but I didn't spot gonna, it. But now I'll go back and look at it. I'm gonna see if I can find. I think I can find a picture of it. Oh yeah, I think I just about landed on him. If I can just get a cut, and then I'm gonna get a picture. I'll send it your way and see see what you think. But we'll we'll just keep going. We won't we won't slow down our there he is. Um but yeah, it's <laughs> it just that moment when I saw this was like, what the fuck? Like what are you doing over there? Um but uh yeah. And let's see if I can copy this. Boop. There we go. Um but anyway, uh so moving on, we uh we're on to number three, yes? Yes, we are on to number three, which is Contamination by Luigi Cozy or Lewis Coates. Another very American name. Yes. The most American of Americans. Yes. From, from, from America land. Yes. Lewis Coates. Um, mm-hmm. this, this was your favorite of the bunch, correct? I think mm-hmm. it was Michael's. Uh, no, it, it might've been Michael's. I was the one that really went for cruel jaws of the bunch, but, yeah. uh, yeah, but this one, I enjoyed the hell out of this one though. I, I really, um, to, to start off quickly is I love that Luigi Cozzi as a director and as a, and, and with the work he does on his, the scripts for his films as well, he puts a ton of material into the movie I've I've this is now the third this is the second film I've seen all the way through but I also have watched um it was one of those I put it on realized I didn't have time to finish it never got back to it but uh, the killer must kill again which is one of the giallos he oh, did oh yeah and that's an awesome like what the fuck is gonna happen next kind of movie like it just keeps turning and twisting as a giallo movie that is a fantastic murder murder mystery thriller and um and uh, I love Star Crash to death um yeah and. And it's yeah, that is a it, I love that Star Crash is the movie that people thought Star Wars was going to be. And it sort of shows even if it had been the movie, the cheesy movie, everyone thought it would have been. That still wouldn't have been a bad thing either, because, <laughs> you know, you know, it's it's uh, I mean, it wouldn't have changed the world like it did. But, you know, it's still a fun movie. Caroline Monroe is great in that film. And, you know, you got Christopher Plummer reversing the flow of time. And Joe Spinell is fucking Joe space. Spinell. Dracula. Yeah, yeah. He's he's your uh, um, Darth Vader type character. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Kotsi has a, a interesting filmography because he also does the Italian cut of Godzilla: King of the Monsters. Yep. Yep. Um, and but he he does that movie Paganini Horror, which I've been meaning to do on reference this film. Um, but 
it's so weird because I I think I think that um, his career is like mostly like as a writer. I think like working with Dario Argento. I think. Uh, well, the, uh, the one film he has credited is uh, Four, uh, Four Flies on Grey Velvet. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Oh, excuse me. And uh, it looks like he was a special effects artist on a couple of shots of Phenomena. I'm looking up his uh, Wikipedia. And um, that's the main the main works that are credited here. I'm sure if I go into IMDb, there'll be a little bit more. Oh, he also was a second unit director on Stendhal Syndrome and Two Evil Eyes, which I'm assuming oh, is the, uh, the, black, yep. yeah, the black cat segment. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, yeah, he, he works a lot with, or worked a lot with Argento. So, yeah, he he's just got a really interesting career. Um, it, it's so weird, to to me that, like, I guess that Contamination is, like, his most well-known film, but I think that that's because it was on the Video Nasties list, which always mm-hmm. blows me away. This movie was banned in the UK. There were people who owned, like, little... VHS distribution companies that went to jail on obscenity charges for releasing movies that were on the video nasties list and contamination is one of them. I yep. like what, you know, it's with the ex- movie exploding bodies, any sort of blood or violence, whatever was the case. It just, it freaked people out. And, and I'm wondering if like the whole way they link, like the contaminate, the eggs is sort of like an allegory for, um, drugs from Colombia, you know, like, yeah. like the cocaine. Like, I'm wondering if that's part of it was like this, like, Oh no, they're showing drug content under, you know, and the subterfuge just, and it's like, it's shown as a negative. It's shown as an alien invasion. Like what the fuck is your problem? Right. Yeah. And also kind of like this, like kind of calm, communist like kind of terrorist aspect to it but the the thing the thing of it is because i i used to really be fascinated with the video nasty scare like i did a whole um like uh paper on it uh when i was in film school and it seemed to be that the like main thing that, that all of those movies had in common was a combination of like sex and violence you know, mm. sexual violence, rape, things like that um, were usually the reason that it got on the list. I mean, even like a movie like The Evil Dead, the real reason it was there because of the tree rape scene. Mm-hmm. Contamination doesn't have any of that. I mean, it's like maybe a little graphic, but not, I mean, yeah. not yeah, really. Yeah. I mean- the gore is graphic, but like the only like quote unquote sexual violence is the uh, the bathroom scene where she's locked in the bathroom with the egg that's going to explode and kill her. But they rescue her. So, I mean, so nothing, right. nothing, nothing ends, nothing ends up happening. Yeah, it's a pretty tame movie, to be fair. And and honestly, in my opinion, I, I just I find it kind of boring. I think that when it's good, it's it's pretty damn good. I like the exploding stomach stuff. I think that that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, the movie's not super graphic. There's, I can't even recall if there's nudity in it. I don't believe there is. Yeah. I don't believe so. Yeah. I don't think there ain't there. You know, I think Joe Bob Briggs would be disappointed. There ain't one naked breast in the entire there's, movie. There's no breast. There's, there's, yeah, there's nothing. There's nothing to this movie that says offensive. Right. I mean, the, you know, I mean, when you see the creature, I mean, maybe it's got like maybe just I don't know. I, I, I was pretty zonked out and tired when I watched the end of the, the I've only seen this one once out of the bunch that we, we we reviewed here. And I wonder if like maybe you can see, I don't know, some monster vag at the end, like, you know, which I mean. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, but it's so weird. It's so weird that this one ended up on the video nasties. Yeah. No, totally. I love that apparently, according to the trivia, at a uh, Q&A of the film, Luigi Cozzi said it was partially funded by Colombian drug dealers. <laughs> well, that's perfect. <laughs> well, I mean, and part of it part of it is shot in Colombia. I was it wondering is. about that. So, <laughs> I guess we didn't really describe the plot. Uh, it, this is, well, this is yet another movie that's uh, a ripoff of, well, the first Alien, in a sense. Mm. Um... But yeah, I mean, like there's this uh, abandoned freighter, right? That ha- that's transporting Colombian coffee, and inside of the boxes are these eggs that, when they explode, release this uh, bacteria that causes your stomach to fucking explode. 
And, uh, the, yeah, the government teams up with this astronaut who went to Mars and <laughs> said that he saw eggs on Mars to figure out where these eggs are coming from. But it turns out that they're not really eggs. They're some sort of weapon of some sorts, which yeah. is kind of weird, too, because, like, okay, the, the eggs explode, and, and cause people to die but it's just weird it's like so that's all that's all they do like they don't they don't actually like hatch or have any ability to like uh, uh make more of themselves they don't like spread spores that turn into other eggs it's just it's kind of a weird it's a really weird plot a really yeah. weird monster or or enemy mm-hmm which I, I kind of appreciate it. I mean, I, I like, you know, as I say that, you know, Kotsi as a as you know writer director has this tendency to have films that are jam packed, you know, with different ideas. And I and although I mean, I will say like the killer must kill again, his script for four flies and uh, then as well, um, uh, Star Crash. There's a more of a consistent through line. And my understanding from what I was re- researching on this film today was that. The producer wanted the James Bond angle with like a kind of super villain and all this stuff in Colombia and all that sort of stuff. And so um, and the, the idea of it being like, you know, inadvertently, you know, although although possibly funded by uh, Colombian drug dealers, that it was a film that was essentially casting them as these alien contaminant bad guys that are corrupting the world, you know. Um, like this, and there's even like the whole idea that like they're connected to their product because the the bad guy Hamilton uh, has these psychic links with the eggs. So whenever they burst, it's like part of him like hurts and is in pain. He has a psychic link with the monster, whatever the yeah. hell they are. But it's it's yeah, it's a bizarre film full of ideas that I kind of like. It feels like in the vein of like one of these sort of Fulci or Argento films where there's a lot of like hypnotic dreamlike elements and scenes that are kind of disparate but there's sort of these vague through lines that kind of tie things together elementally that you know it's a which i that's what i liked about it i and i like that it feels like a bunch of it almost feels like a like a weird short story compilation but they try to take the short stories yes. and like make them into this one thread yeah that's what i was gonna say it's one of those movies that like there are a couple of different elements that could have just been their own movie um, that, yeah, it's like, it, it feels like a lot of these plots that almost feel like its own contained little short story. Uh, cause like, you know, the, the alien pods, you know, could have just been its own thing without like the, the kind of James Bond aspect. And like, it's, it's such a, such a weird movie. And like I said, I think when it's good, it's good when you have, People's stomachs exploding. That's really good. I like the alien scene, the queen alien at the end. Um, it's got Ian McCulloch in it, and I, I mm-hmm. love Ian McCulloch. Um, if if it wasn't for him, I think that like the majority of this film would be like a big stinker. Um, but at least he's fun to watch. Uh, but I, there's just uh, maybe a little too much downtime in this movie for me. Uh, it's not very exciting. Interesting. I, I can I can respect that. I I and I will admit when this film gets bogged down to for me as well. Like I kind of almost dozed off in the yeah. middle, like to, in, around the end of the second act and into the third act was where it started to like okay like the whole. Tr- trip to Colombia is cool, but like the scene in the hotel and like how mm-hmm. long it takes for the guy to sneak the egg into the gal's bathroom and lock her in that takes around, I want to say like four minutes and it's like, yes. holy shit, you could have gotten this done in 30 seconds and been done. And that's, and that's the aspects where you have an element of like the sense of padding, um, which yes. shows up through, through the film. So it's really tight. I, I guess like the full uncut version is 95 minutes and you probably could easily have chopped another like five or eight minutes out of it, you know, without, without cutting anything too important. Absolutely. I think you could have went down to like an 80 minute film. Man. With this, man. A little more to the point (laughs) on a lot of this. Um, it, it, yeah, it's, it's weird. There's like a lot of like 
development of like figuring out like kind of like what the eggs are and where they come from and like a lot of like these like weird twists and turns of like they're from space no they're not from space they're no they are from space well there's an alien it's like oh man they should have just you know. it kind of feels like this this script was like wandering around for a little bit that that Kotze was like oh I get this sense that he's like I don't really know where I want to go with this through like a certain point of the film it's yeah. yeah it it's one that i feature i've talked about this film once on my channel on a episode of five films that i really want to like more than i do because this is one that i really want to like and i've given it so many chances uh I've, I've seen this one more than the other films on this list or on this uh on this podcast and uh it's my least favorite by far mm. Yeah, mm. I don't know what it is about it. It's a little slow for me. Interesting. Well, I mean, it's that's that's how it, that's them's the breaks. I mean, it's a you know, uh, like I said with Shocking Dark, it's like you know, it's these things that you feel like in your head. I should like this more than I do, but but it's a and you want to, but it's like there's those those components that hold it back. Yeah. The um. So regarding the um. So regarding also about like the ideas like not knowing where to go with things. So Alien came out in May of 1979 and it came out in Italy. Let's see if I can find that information. Um, so let's do a little math here because we actually have the shooting dates for uh, for contamination. So if that's the case, can we do a little math here and see how long it went from Aliens release in Italy to them uh, really starting on contamination, just just the filming of it, let alone the pre-production. OK. It came out in Italy in October by January 10th of 1980 or January 14th, maybe possibly um, around there. They were already shooting contamination. So that's like, was that four months? Yeah. So. I, you know, with the fact that you have a producer that's not letting him do what he wants to do with it is like literally even like he wanted to use stop motion animation for the monsters. And they said, no, we want an animatronic. Right. Um, uh, they did, li did let him cast uh, Caroline Monroe for um, for Colonel Holmes. Uh, this, that's what went to Luis Marlowe instead. Um you know, which it, with, with mixed results, I, I like Luis all right as as the part. I would have liked to have seen Carolyn Monroe. Um, I kind of liked the animatronic, but I also wish it, had, you know, that, that stop motion would have been awesome. Yeah, so, I'd be curious to see what that would look like. Yeah, um, but it's uh, so and and it sounds like the producer was the one that they insisted on putting the James Bond elements and not and kind of going away from science fiction. They even changed the title. His title he wanted was Alien Arrives on Earth, and. Uh, the producer wanted to use name contamination, which, according to Wikipedia, had been the working title for an aborted film he had been developing based on the China syndrome. Oh. And the name was, and the name was duly changed against Kotzi's <laughs> witches. So those types of circumstances to the point that even like when it comes to like the animatronic, you know, the you know, which, again, was totally overruled by the producer. Kotzi claimed, I guess, the thing did not work. It barely moved. And so he had to basically use the really rapid cuts and the low light and everything to just hide the fact that they were just stagehands were puppeting it from the okay. side. So. So, I it mean, look, it looks good. I mean, you know, I, I like the, the queen alien at the end. That's like one of the best parts of the movie, I think. Oh, easily. Yeah, it's, no, it's cool. Looking. Yeah, uh, it, it it actually a trivia note it actually looks a little more like the mon kind of more like what my original idea of the queen monster was supposed to be in high score before uh we had to start going and you know realizing oh, okay we don't have the resources for that oh really yeah i kind of wanted something that sort of took up the wall of the room because I, what i wanted was something like um either like the uh the alexia monster at the end of Co resident evil co veronica or um resident evil 2's wall vagina you know when burke oh, turns into yeah. The giant wall of China just coming at you on the train. Yeah, but. yeah. It does, yeah. I'm just trying to yeah. picture that now in high school. <laughs> like the, a big monster. That would have been cool. Yeah. It would have been cool, but oh my God, we had no money. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, but. Yeah, I think it's funny too that. Um, uh, Ian McCulloch, he uh, he's in three 
uh, films that ended up on the Video Nasties list. And he's like a a British actor. And I saw an interview with him where um, he ended up getting like kind of blacklisted then because he was known as the UK guy who's been in three of these movies that are like, you know, banned under, you know, penalty of being fined or arrested. He was in Zombie. Uh, he was in Dr. Butcher, MD, and this movie. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a bummer. Cause he's, and he's good in all three of them. And He's you know, really was, good in all three of them. He's a good actor. He is. Yeah. I actually re- he's actually, for me, was one of the highlights of this movie. I really like that whole story of going to track him down and the mystery and story. Like, that's what I mean. Like, these elements of these short stories. Like, you know, like, that is its own arc. You know, it's like, it's it, it kind of, and it kind of completes. It, it has a catharsis at the end where he defeats his old, uh, his old pal turned evil. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, like I said earlier, he carries this film. If it wasn't for him, um, I feel like the the movie would take a, a pretty big nosedive, at least in my opinion. And it's funny, I didn't know that uh, uh, Coetzee wanted uh, Caroline Monroe. I think that that would have really helped. Ian McCulloch mm-hmm. and Caroline, uh, Caroline Monroe? That's, oh, yeah. There you go. There's your star power. Yep. yep. Too bad. I wonder yep. why. I wonder what the the reasoning for not ca- uh, casting her would have been. I mean, she was already a Bond girl at that point, right? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, because because yeah. uh, yes. What am I thinking? Yeah, she was. Oh god, what Bond film was she in? I can't remember now. Um, uh, is it For Your Eyes Only? Which one is she? I think in? I think it's For Your Eyes. I think you're right. I think it's For Your Eyes Only. I'm gonna take a look. Uh, James Bond's. Oh, Spy Love Me. Excuse me. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have. I am very behind on my. Um, yeah. Oh, that's right. Her voice is dubbed in that film. Yeah. That's oh, right. is it really? Yeah. Oh man, that bums me out. I hate when they do that. Yeah, yeah. especially for a good actor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. Someone who has some real chops. Yeah. Too bad. But yeah, I mean. Um, you know, one thing that I do really like about Contamination is um, I like the uh, sometimes diegetic, sometimes non-diegetic uh, musical cues that the eggs give off, that kind of pulsating I, sound. Yes. I love yes. that. Yeah. I mean, that was one thing I wanted to mention was that the creepiness of it, you know, of the egg, the eggs themselves are really like inspirationally creepy. Like, I want to pay homage to that. I love mm-hmm. that sound. I Love the look. I love the way they pulse and ooze. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that that's all, like, the eggs themselves are done pretty well. I wish that, yeah, I wish, I wish there was just a little bit more going on with this movie. I don't know. I don't know what it is about this one, but every time I watch it, I kind of tune out and then tune back in and then tune out. But, yeah, the music is cool. It, it like, the music is what the like the soundtrack and the sound effects are what make the movie like kind of creepy it's got a little bit of a creepy vibe to it and i almost just wish they would have done a little bit more that maybe the creature like the the queen or something would have played a little bit more of a part in it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah oh yeah oh man can you imagine if like the closer they get to the queen that knows it's coming for them like it's like it's trying to make a psychic link as well. So like McCulloch's character starts getting headaches and he's like, he can't explain why. Right. Like, yeah. He's getting visions of it. You know, cause that's the thing is like, he basically is just a guy despite having gone, being an astronaut and gone to Mars and had this horrifying experience, you know, kind of love crafting experience on other planets. And, um, so, and you know, so it's like they, they don't use those things, but yeah, but that's the problem with these kind of pictures is they, they don't have that sort of, they either it's sometimes it's time, sometimes it's the idea, you know, the limitation of ideas. And also it's that they're, they, they don't think to add those things because, you know, it's, it's, we don't have any time to come up with anything. You know, we just got to right. do what's, you know, it's very uh placeholder, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, obviously this production was very rushed and yeah, uh, yeah it seems like, uh, nobody was really happy <laughs> with the direction, not the director, not the producer. They're just like, look, we just got to get this done. Yeah, but they but, you know, but it made money. And because um, my understanding, it actually made quite a bit of money for the for the financiers. And um, the uh, 
and what's strange is that it is, you know, it is a very well known film. Um, and I mean, even um, Rift Tracks has done this. And, oh, really? Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, and uh, uh, the thing I was going to say about regarding the the quality who like um, it actually. So, again, the the details, according to again, according to the Wikipedia hour, um, it took it was shot across eight weeks between January 14th and March 4th. And so that meant three weeks in Rome for interiors, then two weeks split between uh, New York and Florida and then Columbia. And so, yeah, that's a lot of time to figure. It makes me wonder if, like, that's the reason why some of that stuff, it's kind of like mixed quality is like they had the, you know, some days they had time because they got ahead or because they they were able to figure out like an idea, a solution of, you know, how they were going to do it. Because, I mean, there's some really when you consider the shooting schedule and, the, and particularly the budget, like, I mean, all the stuff on the ship interior, you know, it's pretty complicated. You know, you got oh, all these yeah. lighting. You got lighting setups. You've got splat rigging. You've got the uh, the gore effects. You have the uh, oh, and then when they come into the room uh, with the the egg where the explosion's taken place, and they frozen it, and so there's all that ice that they then have to put down in the space. They then have to set up those uh, dolly tracks as well. They actually see in the shots. So they play it off as like a um, their uh, 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 tracks for dolly uh, crates around oh, the, the, yeah. the the cargo hold. So that was a clever idea. So, I mean, there's there's a lot of – and I think that's just one little chunk that they then have to do. And then there's, like, the police attack assault on the warehouse. And then there's, you know, these exterior scenes that then lead into, like, filming in that apartment where they meet McCulloch's character, Commander Hubbard, which apparently is an L. Ron Hubbard reference. Oh. <laughs> according, to, according to the trivia. Um, because uh, it references two sci-fi authors for the two guys, uh, uh, Hamilton, which is a reference to Edmund Hamilton, who wrote the Star Wolf books, and then L. Ron Hubbard, huh. who before before being a disgusting cult leader was yeah. a uh, was a, was a sci-fi author. Yeah, pretty prolific sci-fi writer too. Supposedly, yeah. Yeah, I've never read any of his stuff, but I mean, he, he had to have been pretty good. I think they. I think I've heard something like he. Man, I, I don't know. I don't want to give something that's like completely off, but I swear I heard that he's like like written more stories than like anyone else in history. That L. Ron Hubbard would just crank out so that like Scientology, like they have a library that's just dedicated to his work and it's like full of his shit that he just he cranked out more like completed stories than anyone else i swear i've heard maybe and maybe that's just propaganda from the church of scientology but i swear to god that there's some weird thing with l ron hubbard and like the amount of of sci-fi stories that he pumped out in his life yeah so reportedly he did hold the right he may have held the record in the mid-2000s but it looks like he uh, lost that to someone else at some point in the last like 15 years oh really Wow. That's what that that appears to be the case. So hey, you were you were mostly correct. Mostly correct. Yeah. He, I mean, he must have been good, right? He must <laughs> he must have been a good sci-fi author. Oh god, I'm just getting Garth Marenghi's Dark Place flashbacks. Yeah. I'm an author who is I'm an author who's written more books than I've read. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's a super underrated show. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um yeah, contamination. You know, it's it's a um, it's 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 a big ride. It's got a lot of stuff. I mean, what's kind of one of the cool things about all three of these movies is a lot of stuff happens in them, and it's kind of cool that you know we're discussing Italian ripoffs. That's the whole theme here: is the Italian ripoffs of other movies. And, and I gotta give them credit that okay, are you getting ripped off? Not technically, because even though you may have seen this before. There's a lot of shit going on in these movies. Yes, for sure. Yeah, especially this one. This one, I think, is the least ripoff of the three. Contamination. It's a. It's so much of its own thing. I feel like. I mean, there are scenes uh, that that uh, look like it's referencing Alien, but for the most part, it's pretty much its own thing. Mm-hmm. And it takes inspiration from other places, too. Like, yeah. I love the whole uh, the derelict ship, which is pretty much straight out of uh, Dracula at the beginning as well. Oh, yeah. Um, I didn't even think of that. Uh, of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I mean, then like, yeah, like there's just these little different subplots and stuff that kind of keep, you know, that have little elements that's like, huh, okay, this sounds, you know, well, I guess also I'm thinking, probably thinking of like, well, we've tracked down the source of this thing to this country here. And maybe just think of, um, oh God, what was it? Cut and run the Diodato. Oh uh, yeah. Jim jo- the Jim Jones one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, uh, I mean, need to finish that. I started watching that and I, I need to finish that. It's still on prime. I gotta, yes. I gotta finish that. You know, but anywho, um, does that kind of cover? I don't, I don't, I don't really have anything else to say because I just continue saying like, yeah, this movie's good. These movies are fun. Yeah, um, yeah, that's about all I got for contamination. Um, yeah, th- this was a good episode. Like all three movies, for the most part, are are really enjoyable. Um, I mean, like I said, contamination for me is a little bit slow, but I, it it does get. Uh, it does get points for for being one that like I want to like more, kind of like y- you feel with Shocking Dark. It's like exactly. I want to like it more than I do. Uh, right. For whatever reason, it doesn't always click with me, and I'm still waiting for it to click because I'll give movies multiple chances. So mm-hmm. maybe yeah. one day contamination will click with me. But mm. uh, yeah, that's about it. Shocking Dark was my favorite. Cruel Jaws was a pretty close second. It was it's super enjoyable, and uh, and then you got Contamination, which I want to like more. So I think, uh, uh, my opinion, they're they're all winners. They all get uh, um, at least a passing grade. Nice. Anyway. Yeah. I, I. Yeah. It's 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 a good list, and you know I uh, it's an understandable list. You know for for. You know, with the reasons you explained. And for me, yeah, Cruel Jaws, then uh, Contamination, then Shocking Dark at the end. But uh, but it's a case of that I didn't, especially now that I've like I've had time to think about it, we've had time to discuss it, and I've researched a bit, I don't regret going through these, which is, I think, the thing that, the best thing that can be said. Because I have seen films that I regret seeing. Um, still not getting that $9 back for seeing the Foot Fist way in theaters. That that did not work. <laughs> that did not work for me. Um but uh but yeah no this is this is a good time and it's and it was cool to take a little this actually got me started you know watching more euro horror italian stuff you know as i mentioned i watched floor flies and very velvet for the first time uh i watched a jess franco movie i had never seen um was it the virgin among the living dead i hadn't seen that before and uh and uh and that was actually surprisingly excuse and that was surprisingly uh artsy at times, which was which was rad. So I mean, this this was kind of a cool way because it took us weeks to finally like go from this is our idea. We've watched the movies to get in the podcast together, which is why it ended up just being the two of us instead of desperation to get it done. Um, yeah, this one's been a long time coming, and yeah, I I need to be better about it. Um, I yeah, I get busy, and then the podcast kind of falls to the wayside. But it's a I, I really enjoy doing these. Yeah, it's yeah. a good. Time. I mean, it, hey, it gave me time to work on my other podcast because, yeah. because I do other, I do other, I do other stuff. Not that I I'm not entirely sure there'll be much crossover appeal between Laverne and Shirley and Italian horror movies, but well, definitely plug your podcast for well, sure. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I mean, it makes okay, okay. I mean, I I I mean, I will say you know, yeah, you can find us at Night After Night or Night After Night Pod. Uh, you know, we're, we're on like the different social medias and stuff, but you can watch us on YouTube and Anchor. We use Anchor to get the pod out, so it's on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. The funny thing is, is despite it being a podcast about a goofy, silly, kind of smutty 1970s sitcom, um, my co-host Lisa and I, we are such horror nerds. We have now referenced Cronenberg, Lucio Fulci, Joe D'Amato, uh, Brian Usna t- three times now. <laughs> um it just it keeps we're just such nerds it's gonna it keeps coming up at uh, evil dead we've mentioned evil dead a bunch but that with in lisa's case that makes sense because she's a hardcore bruce campbell fan but anyway yeah so that's that's if you want to if you want to hear more of my spouting opinions i can't imagine why after two hours of this but um but yeah there's that as as well and and so calvin what's your what you, what projects do you have coming up on your uh on your channel soon um, just uh, cranking out my uh, top five movies of uh, of the '80s, going year by year. I still don't really have a title for it because it was so spur of the moment. Started as one video for the uh, 40th anniversary of 1980, and then everyone said, "Keep this going. Do do every year in the '80s." 
Um, so yeah, just, just doing those and, um, working on uh, a lot of other people's projects right now, but, um, Jesus, I was evil is, uh, now on Tubi, which means that you can watch it for free, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, my new feature film don't sleep tonight is very, very close. Uh, to being completed, mm. just uh, finishing up the music. Uh, the guy who's doing the score is finishing that up. I uh, can't wait to get that out there. And um, yeah, I guess uh, I, I meant to throw a shout out to Friday the 13th Vengeance, which is a, mm. uh, a fan film that I was in. Uh, it's getting a, its Blu-ray release. I already ordered my copy. You can find it. Um, I know that you can already watch the movie for free, but, uh, you know, if you want to support me and other uh, horror filmmakers, I, I highly suggest tracking down the uh, the Blu-ray copy of the film. It's a fun movie. You get to see my butt in the movie, too. So oh, there you go. Oh, yeah. Hey, yeah, are, are, you, are you are you do, so? OK, so so let's see. Are you are you one of those people that actually has a butt, a good screen butt, or do, or do you feel like you, or do you feel like you're too judgmental of your ass? I I really enjoy doing nudity. Actually, I really like it. I really have mm. fun with it. I'm yeah. gonna need to send you my Giallo script then. There's yes, a lot, there's a there's a lot of nudity in that film. I I love it. I I love it uh, m- mainly because I think that it's it's ridiculous how. Uh, guys will just never do nudity but then you always hear guys harp on actresses who don't do nudity right it's like oh Mm -hmm. you know so and so won't get naked right like Halle Berry I know Halle Berry shows nudity but it's an example you know it's like she won't do nudity and it's like most guys won't either it's pretty hilarious guys are mm-hmm. guys are the real babies there so you know yep. I, you gotta put your money where your mouth is and i yep. also think it's it's funny i don't know male nudity is funny to me yeah so. dude yeah the meat and potatoes are always hilarious yeah it's whole it, it's it's all for fun you know and yeah. you know i already got i already got uh uh girlfriend soon to be fiance wife so you know i I ain't worried about nothing (laughs) (laughs) you're all you're all set there you you ain't got nothing you got nothing to prove (laughs) i got nothing to worry about i ain't going out on the dating scene i'm I'm done so yeah so yeah i'll do i'll do nudity so yes i made the script yeah right (laughs) <laughs> wait is this the fucking mo- this is what we're ending on isn't it we're just totally just gonna end on like all right and now for five minutes about talking about penises on film yeah yeah <laughs> that is uh you know that would be an awesome top five for your for your channel it is top five dicks in movies oh that's a good one and especially like dick appearances for like what reasons like one of the ones that shocked me at the way they used it because it was so um frank about it was Jungle Holocaust. Like, I the nudity in that film oh, was, yeah. like, was really well handled in that. Mm-hmm. Because it's, because like, it's, it's terrifying. It's, exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, that is, like, one of the most, like, vile, like, on a male sexual assaults I've mm-hmm. seen in a film. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. really... Yeah, and but, they, yeah. Like, yeah. hang him up. And they, like, put him on the pulley system, and he's naked. Mm-hmm. It, like, always makes me cringe. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's not like uh, wearing clothes would have uh, helped him if he fell, but still, the fact that he's naked, being hoisted up above these rocks, it, it, it always freaks me out. It makes me cringe when I watch that movie. Ghost Story is another one. Where yes, the, that's not, the guy yep. falls out the window naked in the very yep. beginning of the movie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, that's a good scene. Yeah, that's a that was a, I, that was a shocker film for how good that was. I, I watched that about a year ago, and I was like. Whoa! This is I. It's, I like. It's I, scary. Yeah. Scary That's movie. A fat, scary movie. Cool. All right, we swung it back onto horror films. Okay. Is there anything else we want to cover today? I think that's it. I think that's all the the updates I got. Awesome. Yeah. And, and for me, I'm just gonna. You know, I I uh, I did put out high score the Smog's Not Dead segment on YouTube. So if you right. want to want to see that, because I know watching Smog's Not Dead and one sitting high score get kind of falls to the wayside just because you're pretty exhausted by the end um but uh, uh but yeah if you want to just watch it all nice and contained it kind of works on its own and uh so that was kind of cool it's it's not 
doing great numbers when I'm hoping like in silence we suffer it starts doing better later and uh, yeah and I'm going to be doing filming and editing duties on a new film that has zombie